Good morning. We're going to start soon. Just wait for more people to, to arrive and we can start. Okay, so let's wait one more minute, see if more people arrive quickly, and then uh, we'll start. Okay, let's start. So um, we had the test last Thursday. Um, I emailed everyone uh, their grades. So if you haven't checked your email this morning, uh, you can check it whenever you want. And uh, you should have an email from me that that uh, that gives you your grade on test one. Okay. Um, I checked all the all 30 emails I sent. I think it was 30. And it looked like all 30 uh, exams were sent, right? If you open the email, you don't see the picture I attached, you can just email me and let me know and I'll resend it. But I think all 30, if that's the number, all of them, uh, the, the tests were sent correctly. So I don't think that's a problem. Okay. Um, okay, so you should all have your grades now when you check. So that's taken care of. So today we're going to continue. Um, the last homework we went over was homework four. And so we focused so when I asked if there were questions of the homework, I asked if there were questions about the homework on chapter three. So there was also the rest of the homework assignment that covered sections in chapter four. Uh, so I'm gonna go over that now. So does anyone have any questions about from homework four in sections 4.2, 4.3, or 4.4? Anyone have questions about the rest of that homework assignment that was due before the exam? Okay, there are no questions, I'm gonna keep going. So uh, let's continue. So uh, so on Wednesday, last Wednesday, which was two classes ago, but the class, the last class that we didn't have a test. So last Wednesday, uh, we went over uh, a Poisson distribution, right? And uh, we talked about how it approximates how the Poisson distribution uh, approximates um, the binomial probability function or probability distribution, right? Uh, so just to remind you, this was from another class. This was definition 4.7 and it was let uh, lambda uh, be a positive constant. The function, uh, so the function uh, rho of x colon uh, lambda, which is equal to the fraction uh, lambda to the x e to the negative 
lambda over x factorial uh, for x equals to 0, 1, 2, 3, and so forth. Posit any non-negative integer um, is the Poisson uh, probability function uh, with parameter lambda. Okay, so each different parameter lambda gives you a different Poisson probability function okay, in that way. And also, uh, we also had this, that if little n is large and little and p is small, so that lambda, which is equal to n times p, is moderate, then the binomial probability function is approximately equal to the Poisson probability function. Okay, so we had those two things last time, and then we did an example, um, and then we did an example, and then we did an uh, example. Uh, 4.15. Okay. okay, so now this class, uh, we are going to uh, talk about uh, examples of random nomina with Poisson distributions. So what kind of what kind of situations Kind of situations would have a probability function that looks something like that, right? So we have examples of that. Um, then we'll talk about the Poisson process processes, okay? Um, and then we'll have examples we should have time to talk about the cumulative distribution function. We may not finish it probably, but we'll talk about it. Cumulative distribution functions of discrete random variables. Okay, and so uh, those are the topics we're talking about today. And at this time, you can talk about it. Okay, so let's do that. Okay, so uh, this is examples of random phenomena with Poisson distributions. What? It's the number of incoming calls within a fixed time interval at certain switch ports. Okay, so the uh, this is an example of a random phenomena with a Poisson distribution, okay? Finding the probability of the number of incoming calls within a fixed time interval, okay? Uh, in the book, this was number five as an example, this section, and it's the number um, of fish caught uh, in a day in certain regions, okay? And 11, the 11th one, this section was the number of emergency patients on a given day in a certain hospital. Okay. Okay, so some random variables are essentially binomial random variables with large uh, parameters. Um, little n and small parameters, little p. Hence, they are essentially uh, Poisson random variables. Okay, so previously we said that if little n is large, right, if little n is large, and you have a small 
parameter little p so that lambda which equals n times p is moderate then the binomial probability function is approximately the same as the Poisson probability distribution and so if you have a random variable that's that's essentially a binomial random variable, I meaning it's it's very close to a binomial random variable, where it meets the conditions of this statement. Then not only is it very close to binomial random variable, well, if it's very close to this, and this is very close to this, then it's very close. It's essentially a Poisson random variable. Okay. Uh, so the way we get this statement is from this one. Okay. So that explains that. Um, let's look at example uh, 4.16. So let capital X be the number of misprints on a page selected uh, at random from a large book. Explain why it may be reasonable to assume capital X is a Poisson random variable. Okay, so let's talk about this. Okay, um, so we're gonna do is we're gonna, let me list the assumptions we're going to make. Okay, we're going to make the assumption that each page in the book um, has little n letters, numbers, um, and other printed symbols. Okay, so there's, we're going to make the assumption that each page has basically little n number of symbols. Two, we're going to make the, the assumption that Um, an error um, in printing a symbol is a success in a Bernoulli random, in a Bernoulli trial of probability P less than 0.1. Three, we're gonna assume that little n is greater than 100 Okay, and we're going to say that capital X is a random variable, which is the number of successes um, in N for nearly trials. Okay, so we're assuming each page in the book has N, little n printed symbols. An error in printing a symbol is a success of probability less than 0.1. And the value of little n is greater than 100. X is the number of successes in the n for many trials. Okay, the misprints, right? Let x be the number of misprints on a page selected at random from a large book. X is, is the number of successes in n for many trials because the success is an error, right? And an error is the same as a misprint. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to say that no, the we want to assume that X is a Poisson random variable. Well, uh, right, if we look at the probability function of X, right, saying that it's a Poisson random variable would mean that the probability function is the Poisson distribution function, right? So, so um, explanation, right? To conclude, capital X is a Poisson in a variable, we can find that the probability distribution slash function of capital X is the Poisson uh, distribution function. If the binomial probability function approximates the Poisson distribution function in this example, then we can alternatively uh, find 
that the probability function of capital X is a binomial probability function. To conclude that capital X is a Poisson uh, random variable. Okay, so I'm going to underline this because this is going. This is the goal of of what we're doing here. We can alternatively find that the probability function of X is a binomial probability function, and that means that if the probability function of X is a binomial probability function, then first we conclude that X is a, is a binomial random variable. But then, if in this case we find that the binomial probability function approximates the Poisson distribution function, is approximately the same, then by concluding it's a binomial random variable, it's also a Poisson random variable. And then we are done, okay? Uh, and so that's the goal. So the goal, uh, to sum up that, but it's the goal is explained by the explanation. The goal is to show that um, that the binomial that the binomial probability function approximates the Poisson uh, distribution function, and then to show that the that the probability function of capital X is the binomial probability function. Okay, does that make sense? So, so if we show that the probability function of X is the binomial probability function, and if we show that the, that the binomial probability function approximates the Poisson distribution function, then we know that X is a um, Poisson random variable. Right. Then we conclude from that that the uh, x is a Poisson random variable. And we are done. Okay. okay. So um, so since step one, since little n is large, right? Little n is greater than 100. Since little n is large, and uh, and little p is small, right? Little p is small because little p we said is less than 0 0.1, which is reasonable to assume that the error is very small and the number of print symbols is large, right? So this little n is large and little p is small, and lambda, which is equal to n times p, which in this case um, is, you know, is close. I would say it's close to 100. It's not the same because we said it's greater than 100. It's approximately point, 100 times 0 0.1, which is 10, right? So maybe it's about 10, which is moderate. And lambda, which equals 10, is approximately 10, is moderate. That means that the binomial probability function approximates the Poisson distribution function. Approximates the Poisson distribution. So you see step one? So you see how that worked? And then now step two, we're just going to show that um, we're going to just uh, find that the probability function in, is. Um, is the binomial probability function. Okay, so the probability function of X um, is the binomial probability function of, of X uh, with, with little n as the number of Bernoulli trials and the probability of success P. Um, okay, and so the reason, the reason for that is that you can, uh, is that um, we, we see that earlier that an error in printing a symbol is a, is a success, right? So an error in printing a symbol 
it's a success in a Bernoulli probability, in a Bernoulli trial of probability p less than one, right? And because there are about n printed symbols on a page, there are, we assume, little n many Bernoulli trials. Yeah, so we have little n Bernoulli trials. We have the probability of success of an error in printing a printed symbol on that page as three p, which is less than 0 0.1, and x, which is the value of our random variable capital X, is the number of successes, and the number of successes is the number of misprints or the number of errors, right? So, uh, so little x is the number of misprints slash errors in printing a symbol on a page. Okay. And so that's why the probability function is the value of a binomial probability function. And so we did both things. Okay. Uh, we said we, we, we did the two things we wanted to do. And so we conclude uh, that, uh, that capital X is a Poisson random variable. So I wrote a lot out uh, so that every step is there. Okay. Uh, and so that's how you can conclude. That's one way you can conclude a random variable is a Poisson random variable. And this problem is a little different than most because normally to show a random variable is a certain, to show X is a certain type of random variable, normally you would say would have the corresponding probability function for it, right? Normally you would wanna say that X has a Poisson distribution to prove it, it's a Poisson random variable. But in this example, since the binomial distribution and probability and the Poisson distribution are approximately the same under certain conditions. We want to show those conditions apply in this example, and then find that its probability function is the binomial probability function, and then it's a Poisson random variable. Okay, so this problem has a little extra step in showing that a random variable is a certain type. Okay, so the next section is 4.5.5.3, and it's titled uh, Poisson processes. Okay, so if a physical process uh, satisfies three conditions, then the random variable capital X that represents the total number of occurrences of this phenomena. phenomenon within the fixed period of time or fixed region of space is a Poisson random variable. Okay, so we're gonna. So these are the three conditions. So the three conditions are one, the number number of occurrences the number of occurrences of the phenomenon in any two or more disjoint intervals of time or regions of space must be independent of each other. Okay, so the number of occurrences of phenomenon in any two or more disjoint intervals of time or regions of space must be independent of each other. So how many times a phenomenon occurs in one region of space has no effect or bearing on the number of occurrences of a certain phenomenon in a disjoint, a completely separate region of space or interval of time. Okay, two, the second assumption, the second condition is the probability of at least one occurrence of phenomena 
during any subinterval of length one over n. is always the same. Also, if P sub N is equal to the probability of at least one occurrence of a phenomenon during any one over N, length interval, then there is a constant lambda positive such that the limit um, as n approaches infinity of n p sub n is equal to n. Okay, so the probability of at least one occurrence of a phenomenon during any subinterval length one over n is always the same. Also, if p sub n is the probability of at least one occurrence of the phenomenon during any one over n length interval, then there is a constant lambda positive that's positive, such that the limit as n approaches infinity of n times p sub n is equal to lambda. Okay, that's the second assumption. Now, the third condition is the probability of two or more occurrences in any given very short interval of time must be smaller than the probability of just one occurrence. Right, which makes sense, right? Saying that something occurs twice should be less likely than occurring once, right? In order for something to occur twice, it has to already occur once, right? So, uh, so saying that something has to occur again would be less likely than occurring once, right? So that makes sense. Um, plus, in any given uh, sufficiently small length of time, the probability of two or more occurrences must be about the same as the probability of one hertz. Okay, so the probability of two or more occurrences in any given very short interval of time must be smaller than the probability of just one occurrence. We did so we said that. Plus, in any given sufficiently small length interval of time, the probability of two or more occurrences must be about the same as the probability of one occurrence. Okay, so not only is the probability of two or more occurrences less likely than the probability of one, it's also very close to it. So it's saying it's very close and smaller. Okay, so both things. Okay. Um, so if three conditions above are satisfied, There is a constant lambda positive such that for each given value of t, the distribution of x of t, x of t is the Poisson distribution with parameter lambda t. That is that the probability of x sub t equaling to some fixed little x is equal to 
this is equal to lambda t raised to the x times e to the negative lambda t divided by x factorial. This is for x equaling to 0, 1, 2, 3, and so forth, non-negative integers, x, little x. Okay, this x of t is this. It, it's the random variable that represents the total number of occurrences of, of this phenomenon within a fixed period of time. Okay, that fixed period of time is represented by t, right? The length of this interval, okay? So note that x sub t is the random variable representing um, the total number of occurrences of this phenomenon within a fixed period of time or length or or interval um, or interval of time of length t. So if these three conditions are satisfied, the probability that there are little x many occurrences of a phenomenon in an interval of length of time, interval of time of length little t, denoted by this lowercase t, the, that probability function is this right, for any non-negative integer little x. So it's a probability that there are zero occurrences or one occurrence or two or three or so forth of an interval of time of length little t. Okay. It's not a t, little t is not representing a point in time. It's representing the length of an interval of time. Okay. Okay. So let's do an example of this. So this example 4.19. Um, the number of telephone calls arriving within a time interval. Um, of length little t in minutes is a Poisson uh, process x of t um, with parameter uh, lambda, which equals two. So the phenomenon here is, the, is a telephone call, right? Um, so we have the number of telephone calls arriving within a time interval of length t in minutes is a Poisson process x of t with parameter lambda equals two, right? Note that the phenomenon here is a telephone call, okay? Uh, so for part A, we want to find the probability that x sub um, x of five is equal to zero. X sub five is equal to zero. And this is equal to the probability um, of no telephone calls arriving during a given five minute uh, period. Okay, so this is the probability of no telephone calls arriving during a given uh, five minute period. Okay, but we're given that X sub T uh, is a um, is a Poisson process, right? So we have the probability of x of t equaling to some fixed x. It's going to equal to, um, well, this formula, 
right? So you can basically plug in. Right? This is from the fact that it's a Poisson process. Okay. Um, so now we just need to plug in the values of each thing here in this formula. Uh, so I'm going to write here because um, so lambda equals two that's given to us, right? Uh, since it's x sub five, right? That means the, the length, the interval length of time t is equal to five, five re representing five minutes. So we have lambda, we have t, and that's what we need. Okay, so we're just going to plug in the values of lambda uh, and the values of t there and there. So you have two times five raised to the x power times e raised to the negative lambda, which is two. Uh, and then two is being multiplied by t, which is five. And then the denominator, it's x factorial. So we have those things there. Then uh, this is going to equal ten to the x e to the negative ten divided by x factorial. Oh, sorry. Wait, wait. Oh, oh, right. So, okay. But now, uh, we're gonna add one more thing here. X little x is equal to zero, right? Um, little x equals zero because x is the number of telephone calls. So there are no telephone calls, right? This is zero. So we want the probability of x of five equaling to zero. So that means x is also zero, right? We have t is fives here. So x is going to be zero. So we're going to plug in a zero for x. And there's going to be a zero here for x. And this is going to be 10 to the zero. Oh, and then that's going to be zero factorial. And so um, 10 to the zero is one. And so you have e to negative 10. Zero factorial is one. So you have e to negative 10 over one. That's equal to e to the negative 10. So the probability of no telephone calls arriving during a given five minute period um, where x is a Poisson, where x of t is a Poisson process with parameter lambda equals two, it's equal to e to negative 10. And e to negative 10 is equal to 0.000045. And it keeps going. It's, it's approximately that. Keeps going to the decimal. Okay, and so that's the answer to part A. That's the probability of no telephone calls arriving during a given five minute period, or the probability of x of five equaling to zero. Okay, B, we want to find the probability of x sub uh, one half is greater than one. And that's equal to the probability of more than one phone call in a one half minute period. Okay. Okay. So we want to find uh, the probability that x sub one half is greater than one. The probability of more than one phone call in a one half minute period. Well, that's equal to one minus the probability of of one phone call in that one half minute period minus the probability 
of zero phone calls in that one half minute period. Okay, so let me pause for a minute, right? So the probability that you receive more than one phone call in a one half minute period is one minus the probability of not getting more than one phone call in a one half minute period. If you don't get more than one phone call, that means you either get one phone call or zero phone calls, right? And so you wanna subtract the probability of one phone call and a probability of zero phone calls in a one half minute period. So you're subtracting these two probabilities from one and that's the same as this probability. Okay, so now we just need to calculate the values of these probabilities in the same way we calculate the probability in part A. By knowing the values of lambda, t, and x, and plugging them in to this formula to get the values of these two probabilities, and then you subtract them from one and you get this. Okay, so let's do that. Okay, so we're gonna apply the formula to calculate those two probabilities. You have one minus, uh, so we have this, um, we have this function here, right? But lambda, uh, lambda is still two, right? So we have lambda is two. We have t, t is one half now, right? Because it's a one half minute period. So we have two times one half raised to the x, but here x is one because it's one phone call. So this is the first. Then we have e to negative lambda. Lambda is two, and t here is one half. So I'm just substituting for the values, and here x is one. Right? So that's the probability of x of one half equaling one. Then you subtract uh, the value where p of x of one half equals zero. Lambda is equal to two. T is still one half because it's a one half. In, in time period, x is now zero because they're, we're looking at the probability of zero occurrences of the phenomenon. X is the number of occurrences of the phenomenon. Lambda is two, t is uh, one half, and then x here is zero. See that? So they're both almost the same except the value of x, the value of little x here is one the lex here is one because there's a one here. Here there's a zero. So the value of little x is zero. So we're using I'm using a value of zero here for little x because of right here. This is that this is what tells you the value of little x, right? Here it's zero. And so you have a zero here. Here it's one. So we have ones here. Here it's zero. So you have zeros here. Okay, so we have the values of those two. We subtract them from one. And uh, when you do that, you get this is equal to um, this is equal to one minus um, e to the negative one minus e to the negative one, and that's equal to um, one minus two e to the negative one. I'm just saying writing a few extra things. This is equal to 0 0.26424. Okay, and so here in this example, 4.19, uh, we calculate values of, we both calculate the value of x sub t, or sum t, and we find the probability of x sub t being greater than the number, okay? So this is practice in calculating values of a Poisson probability function, okay? Um, and so this is 4.5.5.4, and it's called the parameter lambda. Almost done with this section. Uh, so if the numerical value of an experiment is a Poisson random variable, capital X, and if the experiment is repeated 
a number of times, we expect the average value of capital X to be lambda. Okay, so lambda is an average value, but it's an average value in this way, right? So if you say that the numerical value in an experiment is a Poisson random variable X, if the experiment is repeated a certain number of times, then expect the average of X to be lambda. Okay, lambda is the average value of X, a Poisson random variable, uh, when you repeat an experiment. Okay. Okay, so uh, we can now move forward with section 4.6 which is on the cumulative uh, distribution function of discrete random variables. Okay, so we're still gonna be talking about discrete random variables, that those are random variables with a discrete sample space, right? Which in our reference frame, which in this class discrete means finite or countably infinite. Okay, so we have a discrete random variables. We want to talk about what's called a cumulative distribution function of discrete random variables. Okay, so this is definition 4.8. Uh, the function uh, capital F of X of little x, which is equal to the probability that capital X is less than or equal to little x. And this is for some finite um, value of little x is called the cumulative uh, distribution function. I don't know what you mean. Does the chapter overlap? I don't know what you mean. Right, we were at 4.5, now we're 4.6. Okay, so I have a question. Oh. Okay. So, like, can we read the, the steps on the previous example? Um, You mean example four point nineteen? Yeah. You want you want me to go over it again? Yeah. Okay. So example four point nineteen, you have the number of telephone calls that arrive within an, a time interval of length t in minutes, right? So let's say you had ten minutes, right? Um. So okay, is a Poisson process x of t with parameter lambda equals two? So what that's saying is that let's say T equals 10. So X sub 10 would be a, a random Poisson, random Poisson is a Poisson random variable, which would represent um, the number of telephone calls that arrived in any time interval of length 10. Does that make sense? So let's say you looked at 12 p.m. to 12 10 p.m. You'd say in you'd say, you know, how many telephone calls calls arrive between 12 p.m. and 12 10 p.m. But, but then separately you could say that would have to be this that would be the same as from 1 p.m. to 1 10 p.m. or 1 37 p.m. to 1 47 p.m. or 2 08 p.m. to 2 18 p.m. or 4 19 a.m. to 4 29 a.m. right so any time interval of length 10 minutes um, x sub 10 would represent the number of telephone calls arriving within that time interval, okay? So that's what X of T means, right? And you can change the length of time instead of T equals 10, it could be any value of T, right? So for each value of T, you have a separate Poisson random variable X of T representing the number of telephone calls received in any time interval of length T. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And it has with parameter lambda equals two, right? So for each different parameter, you could have a different Poisson distribution function, right? So if we change the value of lambda to three, that would be a different model used than lambda equals two. So we're 
specifying the model we want to represent the number of telephone calls incoming in each time interval of length t, we're, we're specifying that we want the model to use lambda equals two. Does that also make sense? Yeah. Okay, so we're using this probability function where lambda equals two. Okay, and so a phenomenon here is the telephone call, right? So we're looking at the number of times a phenomenon occurs in which that phenomenon is a telephone call. So in A, we want to find the probability that x of five is zero. And so x of five, right? Five here is the t here. So five is telling you that the time interval is length five minutes. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now saying x of five equals zero is saying that the number of times the phenomenon occurs is zero. So x of five equals zero says that in any time interval of length five, any five minute interval, the number of occurrences, the number of telephone calls is zero. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then it's P of that. So P of X of five equals zero is the probability that there are zero occurrences of the phenomenon of a telephone call arriving during any given five minute period. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so the five is a five minute period. The zero is zero occurrences, zero telephone calls. And we want to find the probability of that. Okay, so that makes sense? Yeah. Sorry, excuse me. Um, we're given that this, this uh, random variable x of t is a Poisson process. So that means its probability function is the Poisson distribution function. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so now this probability is equal to the value of this expression for the appropriate values of lambda t and x. Does that make sense? Yeah. So lambda is two, which is given. T is five because it's a five minute interval. X is zero because little x is the number of occurrences of the phenomenon. The phenomenon is telephone calls. And this is saying the number of telephone calls in any five minute period is zero. So the zero here is the value of little x. Makes sense? And you plug it in and you plug it in, you simplify that expression and you get this number. That makes sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Okay, so that's A, so that's A, right? We're assuming a lot. We're assuming that 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 this situation is modeled by a Poisson process, right? X of T is, is, is representing it where it's a Poisson process. So assuming it's a Poisson process is immediately assuming that this strange expression expresses its probability. So the problem is just saying, you know, okay, the probability is represented by this expression, can find it, find the value of it. Make sense? Um, yeah. Okay, so you're not concluding a lot in part A. You're just plugging in the values to the formula. Okay, in part B, it's, it's pretty much almost the same thing. We're not we're not concluding that much. We're just saying that, well, what's the value of this expression kind of? But I want to find the probability that you receive more than one phone call in any one half minute length period. Does that make sense? Yeah. By this notation, right? Just this notation, just that alone is saying, that's the probability. That's the probability that you have more than one phone call received in any one half minute period. Okay, so that's what we want to find. Now, the one here represents the number of telephone calls you receive, right? Yeah. Okay. Saying it's greater than one, right? Right. The opposite. The opposite of receiving more than one phone call would be not receiving more than one phone call, right? If you're not receiving more than one phone call, how many phone calls could you receive? Mm -hmm. Kishan? Yeah. If you don't receive more than one phone call, what are the possible number of phone calls you could receive? Like zero. Or? Um, or zero, or it's like... Uh, not more than one, right? We're saying not yeah. more than one. What numbers are not more than one? What are the number of phone calls that is not more than one? Zero or? Um, like two and negative? Zero or one. Nice. Receiving oh, one phone yeah. call is not receiving more than one phone call. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right, if you receive one phone call, you're not receiving more than one phone call. Okay. So the probability of receiving more than one phone call in any one half minute period 
is equal to one minus the probability of receiving one form call in that one half minute period, minus also the probability of receiving zero. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And so now, just like in part A, where you could use this expression and calculate it for appropriate values of lambda t and x, you use the expression for each of these probabilities, plug in the appropriate values, you get values here, and you subtract both of them from one, and you get this number. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Now, here, t is one half, right? Lambda is always two. Lambda is two. T is one half. And here, little x is one. Does that make sense? Yeah. Here, t is one half. Um, lambda is two, because it's given to be two. And x, little x is zero. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so now you, you can find the values of both of these, subtract it from one, and you get that. Okay. So does the whole thing make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. Any more questions? No. Okay, good. Okay. So that's example uh, 4.19. And that explains what's happening there. Okay, so let's let's continue now um, back to 4.6. Uh, so 4.6 is on the cumulative distribution functions of discrete random variables. So the first thing we usually do in a mathematical discussion is give the definitions. So this is the first definition in this section. Definition 4.8 says the function capital F, right? Make note that there's a capital F as opposed to earlier, which was little f. The function capital F of x is equal to P of capital X less than equal to little x for a finite x, little x, is called the cumulative distribution function. It's the probability that your discrete random variable capital X is at most a value little x for some fixed little x, okay? That's a cumulative distribution function. The probability that your discrete random variable has a value at most some number. Okay. Before we found the probability of it equaling a fixed amount, now we're finding the probability of it being at most some fixed amount. Okay, it's called a cumulative distribution function uh, because, in a sense, you're adding the probabilities of all the values capital X up to and concluding some fixed number little x, right? So uh, you're, it's cumulative, right? And so the larger this little x is, you're gonna add on more probabilities to find the probability of x, capital X, at most something, okay? That's the cumulative part of the name. Okay, so um, let's look at an example. So example uh, 4.20 is finding the cumulative distribution function. Let capital X be a discrete uh, random variable whose only positive value values are negative one comma two comma and five. Okay. X is a discrete random variable whose only positive whose only um, whose only possible values are negative one, two, and five. Suppose the probability function of capital X is little f of X, which is equal to One fourth, or x equals to negative one. One half, or little x equals to two. And one fourth, or little x equals to five. Okay, so that's the probability function of x. Um, so the problem is find the cumulative distribution function of capital X. And I want to note that CDF is the abbreviation for cumulative 
distribution function. Okay, so we could ask the same question. So we could say the same. Uh, so we could say the same thing by saying uh, find the CDF of capital X. Okay, so find the CDF of capital X is saying find the cumulative distribution function of capital X. So I'm going to underline this. I'm going to underline this. Okay, so these are both the same thing except we're using the abbreviation CDF to mean cumulative distribution function. C for cumulative, D for distribution, F for function. Right, and you see there's an obvious advantage to using the abbreviation. You can use the abbreviation, instead of saying find the cumulative distribution function of X, you're just saying or writing find the CDF of X. This is much shorter to say than that. Okay, so we speed things up by using that abbreviation. Um, I'll probably hold off on using the abbreviation at the moment while you're learning it. Later, I'm, I might use this abbreviation. Okay. So we're going to do that. So find the CDF of capital, uh, capital X. So, so capital F of X is equal to the probability that capital X is at most some fixed little x. And this is equal to zero. If little x is less than negative one, okay, the only possible values of capital X in which it, the only values of capital X in which uh, there's a positive probability of, of of the only values of capital X that have positive probability are are values negative one, two, and five, right? There's no chance of capital X having a value other than negative one, two, or five. And so the probability that capital X is less than negative one is zero, right? See that, right? There's no chance that capital X is less than negative one, unless or equal to some value less than negative one, okay? Technically, right? So capital F of little x, which is this, is zero if little x is less than negative one, okay? So the conclusion there, so the conclusion of that statement is that capital F of X is zero for little x less than negative one. Okay. Um, next, if we look at the values of the, of the cumulative distribution function, again, capital F of X, which is probably the capital X is at most some x little x. Um, what is this when What is this for, um, what is this if negative one is less or equal to little x, strictly less than two? Okay. Uh, so if that's the case, if it's little x starting at negative one, but still less than two in that interval, well, the only possible value capital X in this interval, this half open interval or half closed interval, the only value of capital X of probability greater than zero is for little x equaling to negative one. And so the probability of that, oh, sorry, the, right. So the prob, I mean, the probability of capital X at most, a little x in this, the, the, only, the only time this matters is when little x is negative one. So this is the pro, equal to the probability that capital X is equal to negative one. It's the only value of capital X at most any of these little x values in which the probability is greater than zero. And so that's equal to one fourth. Okay, and I guess you could say this is equal to the, the little f of negative one, which is one fourth. Right, the probability x equals negative one is f of negative one, which is one fourth. And so this is if. Negative one is less than little x less than two. And so the conclusion here 
with that one line above it. The conclusion there is that apple f of x, little x, is equal to one fourth if negative one is less than equal to x, strictly less than two. Okay, so now we have that conclusion. Um, next, let's look at more values of, of the CDF capital F. This is the probability that capital X um, is at most some little x. Okay, but now let's look at, at the function if two is less than or equal to x, little x, strictly less than five. Okay, so now this is equal to the probability that capital X is equal to negative one. Uh, plus the probability that apple x is equal to 2. All right, and so the reason for that is, right, if little x is between 2 and 5, including 2, then the only possible values of capital X with non-zero probability up to and including that value little x is when x is little, when, when it's negative 1 or 2. And so you just add up those two values. And so now you add up those two values and get that's equal to one fourth for this probability. Actually, I'll write this is f of negative one plus f of two. Right? Probably capital X negative one is f of negative one, little f of negative one. That probably is little f of two. And then um, you plug in. So f little f of negative one is one fourth plus little f of two which is one half one one fourth plus one half is three fourths so capital f of little x in that interval is three fourths okay and so the conclusion here is that um capital f of x It's equal to three fourths if two is less than or equal to little x or if less than five. Okay, so capital F of x is equal to B of x. Less than or equal to little x. Okay, and so now we want to look at this probability if x is greater than or equal to five. Okay, and so this is equal to the probability of capital X. Um, okay, so so if little x is less than or equal to five, I'm sorry, little x greater than or equal to five. If little x is greater than or equal to five, if little x is greater than or equal to five, then the, you just add the probability that x equals negative one, two, or five. This is the probability x equals negative one plus the probability x is equal to two, plus the probability x is equal to five. Negative one, two, five, okay? So then, this is equal to, and so each of these probabilities are one fourth, one half, and one fourth. It's one fourth plus one half plus one fourth. That's equal to one. Okay, and so now that conclusion, this conclusion is that apple f of little x is equal to one if little x is greater than or equal to five. All right, and so then 
the um, final conclusion is that for uh, finite, for finite little x, or you can write it this way with these two inequalities, negative infinity less than x less than infinity, that's the same thing as saying little x is finite. For a little x finite, we obtain uh, this fun the Q CDF, Gimlet distribution function, capital F. So capital F of x is equal to uh, capital F of x is equal to zero for little x less than negative one. It's equal to one fourth for negative one less or equal to x strictly less than two. It's three fourths for two less or equal to x strictly less than five. And it's one for x greater than or equal to five. I'm just going to line up the numbers. All right, so those numbers are like lined up there. Okay, so, so that's our final conclusion. We found the cumulative distribution function for capital X in that example. Okay, so we found the CDF of capital X in this example. And we're done. Okay, uh, so what I want to do now is I want to graph this function capital F of x to illustrate for you um, what it's depicting. Okay, so what I want you to do is write down, make sure you have written down this function capital F of x I have here because I'm going to go to the whiteboard and so I won't be able to have that on the whiteboard. Okay. So, so write down right now and your, make sure you have written down your notes for finite little x or, or with those inequalities we obtain this capital F of x. I just need tissue for one second. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, okay, so we have that. Okay, so now I'm going to graph capital F. Okay, so here we are. Um, both black. And those are the two axes. We have values of little x here. Um, and we're gonna have values of capital F of x here. So the values we wanna look at are one fourth, one half, three fourths, and one. Okay, those are values of the probability function that we care about. Okay, um, here though, we're gonna have negative three. This is not, this y-axis does not mean the x is zero. This will be negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so those are values of little x by over here. Okay. Um, and so this is going to be the graph of y equals capital F of x, little x. Okay, so now I'm going to draw this. So I'm going to draw the graph using another color. So let's go with pink. 
So, um, so up to but not including negative one, the value is zero. Between negative one and two, not including two, not including two, the height of the function is a constant one fourth. And so that's because of, we found capital F of X, capital F of little X is one fourth for this interval, right? And so now next it jumps to three fourths. So it jumps to three fourths from two to uh, five, but not including, not including five. So we have a horizontal line here, a horizontal line in the open circle on the right. And then for X greater than or equal to five, for little X greater than or equal to five, um, the value is one. Okay, so that makes sense. If you look at the piece, the way we defined capital F of X as a piecewise function, right? Zero, and the value is zero for little x less than negative one. The value is one fourth for negative one, less than or equal to x, less than or equal to two. I mean, strictly less than two. The value is three fourths for two, less than or equal to x, strictly less than five. And the value is one for little x greater than or equal to five. And that's, so that's how you graph it. And you see that this function is non decreasing. Meaning, if you increase the value of x, uh, capital F is either stays the same or increases, right? So the function doesn't have to strictly increase. Non-decreasing means that the value is either staying the same or increasing. So as you move to the right, the value stays the same, then increases here, stays the same, increases here, same, increases same. Okay, so it either increases or stays the same as, as you move forward to the right. Okay, and so that's an illustration of the CDF in that last example, example uh, 4.20. Okay, so now let's go to, let's have, this is an alternate, alternate definition of the cumulative distribution function, CDF of a discrete random variable. Okay, let little f be the probability function of a discrete random variable, capital X, the function capital F of X, which is equal to the sum over all values T, little t, at most little x of F, of little f of T for finites little x is the cumulative distribution function okay the sum i'm reiterating what i wrote what i'm right about to write here is is already said in this notation because in the subscript i have t less or equal to x here okay but i'm going to re reiterate it here in the parentheses by that notation, I mean the sum is over all values of, of t at most little x for which f of t is defined. Okay, so you're adding the values of f of little t 
for all little t at most, this fixed little x here. So, so examples. So, capital F, for instance, capital F of five would be equal to the sum of all f of t such that little t is at most five. Okay, and for instance, capital F of 100 would equal the sum of all f of t such that little t is at most 100. I'm not going to make you add up 100 values, but f of t may only be positive for a certain number of small finite values, right? Even if even if it's at most 100, right? Uh, but I want to use I'm using extreme numbers here just to illustrate the meaning of the five and 100, right? So f of 100, capital F of 100 is the sum of all little f of t, so that little t is at most 100. Okay, so those are two examples of how that notation is working. So let's look at an example. Example 4.2.1, uh, finding the probability, finding the probability with cumulative distribution function. Okay, so before we, in our last example, we had a probability, we were given a probability function, and from it, we found the cumulative distribution function. We're now going to go in the opposite direction. I'm going to give you a cumulative distribution function, and we're going to look at, we're going to find probabilities using it. Okay? And what's important to note is that is we have a discrete uh, random variable here, right? This entire section is only on discrete random variables. Okay. So let, sorry, let capital X be a discrete random variable whose cumulative distribution function or CDF um, is capital F of X, capital F of little X is equal to this piecewise find function zero for x strictly less than negative three one sixth for negative three less or equal to little x strictly less than six one half for six less or equal to x strictly less than ten and one for 10 less or equal to little x. Just gonna space this out. There we go. Okay. Capital X is a discrete random variable whose cumulative distribution function CDF is that. Okay, good. Here it's little x greater equal to 10, right? The number in, in the variable is switched on the sides here. Yep. Good. A finds the probability that capital X is at most is less than or equal to four, which is at most four. And the probability that, that negative five is strictly less than X, strictly is less or equal to four. And the probability that capital X is equal to negative three, and the probability that capital X is equal to four. Okay, so from part A, we want to find those four separate probabilities. 
Okay, so let's start with the probability that capital X is at most four. Okay, well, the probability of capital X is at most four is capital F of four. Okay, so right now we're calculating here. These two are when we find specific probabilities. This we're still using this. Okay, so probability of capital X of most four is capital F of four. And if you look at here, capital F of four, four is in this interval, right, including negative three, nine, including six, four falls right here and here. And so that capital F of that is one sixth. Excuse me, sorry. Um, so that's, that's probably capital X is the most four. The probability that negative five is strictly less than X, less than or equal to four is the difference of two probabilities. It's the probability that X is at most four minus the probability that X is at most negative five. Okay, um, so this is what we want, right? Between in this interval. So I'm gonna go to the whiteboard. If you're looking at between negative five and four, including four, if you're looking at the interval between negative five and four, including four, not including negative five, right? That's why I have an open circle there. If you're looking at that, um, and this is on the number line. So this is a part of the entire real number line, right? You could instead say, okay, I have, I have these values up to four, on the real number line, here's four. Um, all the values, okay, green, it's in green here, okay. All the values up to four on the real number line. Right. Fancy R's is a notation for the entire real line. So if you took the numbers at most four, that's including four, and you subtract from it, all the values up to negative five, I'm gonna do red because we're getting rid of them. Like this is subtracting kind of like a negative connotation. Red sometimes has, this is negative five. So you can think of taking this green thing and removing from it the red part of it. So if you take the green section of the real number line and you remove from it the red part here, you end up with the blue part, right? So what I'm illustrating is the fact that the probability that capital X is at most four, that the probability that negative five is strictly less than X, less than or equal to four, has to be equal to the probability that capital X is at most four minus the probability that capital X is at most negative five. See that? These are two, uh, so you just remove this and you end up with that, right? That makes sense? And so, the, this probability is equal to the difference of this probability and this one. So if you find this probability and this one, you plug them in and you get this number minus that one, and that's the answer. Okay. So let's go back here. So it's this probability minus this one. And these are values of the CDF, the cumulative distribution function. This is capital F of four, the probability that capital X is at most four, minus capital F of negative five, the probability of capital X is at most negative five. And so you can use the given definition of capital F for these values. So capital F of four, X is four, so that's one sixth minus 
we already have that here, minus cap up of negative five, negative five is less than negative three. So capital F of negative five is zero. That's minus zero. That equals one sixth. So that probably is also one sixth. Next, the probability that capital X, the probability that capital X is equal to negative three. Okay, so the probability that capital X is equal to negative three. So here, right, the probability that, that capital X is at most negative three is one sixth, right? But that's at most negative three, not equal to. Now, anything less than negative three, the probability that capital X is at most that is zero. So right before you get to negative three, there's no chance of capital X being any value less than negative three, right? There's no possible way that capital X be any value less than negative three because of this, right? And so the cumulative distribution function jumps from a value of zero to a value of one sixth once you get to negative three. And so since the probability of capital X being any value less than negative three is zero, and you know that cumulatively, the capital X at most negative three, the probability is one sixth, that means that probably the capital X being exactly negative three has to be equal to one six. It has to be equal to the jump in the C, the cumulative distribution function when you reach negative three. Okay, so, so probably the capital X equals negative three is equal to one six. Okay? It's equal to the jump, right? It's not because there's a one six here, it's because one six minus zero is one six, right? The, the amount that you jump once you reach X equals negative three, that jump is equal to one six. Okay, and so um, how much more probably you add by only adding the number negative three is one six, zero plus one six is one six. Okay, and so that's this one. Now the probability that X is equal to four, probably that X is equal to four. Well, that's equal to, uh, well, what's the jump when X equals four? X equals four is, is right in, right in the in the middle of this interval from negative three to six, including negative three. So there's no jump at all at x equals four, right? The probability of the capital X at most negative three is one sixth, and then you keep going, and it's still one sixth when you reach x equals four. So there's no jump in the CDF at x equals four. So probably that's zero. This is probably the this is probably the most difficult part, the last part when I ask you this probability, uh, because you're looking at this interval. And the CDF is saying one sixth, but the probability that X equals four is zero. And again, it's because there's no jump here. Cumulatively, when you're adding the probabilities of possible values of capital X, this is telling you that when you add the probability that X equals four to it, you're not adding anything. It stays one sixth. And so that means the probability of X only equaling one four exactly. I mean, probability of X equaling only four, equaling four is zero. Okay, uh, and so that is uh, part A. And so that concludes this problem. Part B, the question is find the probability function of capital X. Okay, and so the probability function, so I'm almost done, and then we're done with class for today. Uh, so little f of x, the probability function of capital X is equal to um, one sixth for x equaling to negative three. That's because when x equals negative three, there's a jump of one sixth. Um, it's equal to two sixths for x equaling to six. That's because when x equals, when you add x equals six here, it jumps from one sixth to one half. One half is three sixths. So it goes from one sixth to three sixths. There's a jump of two sixths when you add in the x equals six. And then look at the jump here. You start at one half, and then when you add x equals 10, it jumps from one half to one. So that means the probability of x, uh, so that means you have a probability of one half for x equaling to 10, right? So there's a jump of one half. From one half to one is a jump of one half for x equals 10. And now you have those values, but if you add one six plus two six plus one, you get one six plus two six plus three six. That's six six, that's one. So the values 
you know the probability of those three x values are those. And if you add them, you get one, which means there, there are no other positive values of x, no other possible values of capital of x other than negative three, six, and 10. And so that's the entire uh, probability function of, of capital X, that little f of x. Okay, and then we are done. And so that is the end of uh, um, this section. This is the end of 4.6. It's also uh, the end of chapter four. Okay, so we've now covered all of chapter four. And so next class, uh, we are going to start uh, chapter five, okay, which is on continuous uh, random variables and probability uh, density functions. Okay. Uh, okay, so we're, we're done with that. Um, let me just quickly take a look at the homework here. Uh, so you can now work on homework five, right? We finished homework four. And so now uh, you can now do homework. You can do homework five. So I'm going to sign homework five. That covers 4.5, 5.4, and 4.6, um, which we just finished. This is perfect timing. And um, so homework five. And so homework five is going to be due um, this next class. And so homework due uh, homework five is due on Wednesday, two days from today. So today is Monday. It's due in two days on Wednesday. And so we will go over it. We will go over homework five at the start of class on Wednesday. Okay, and then we'll stop. So we're going to stop there. Okay, remember I sent your exam um, grades by email, um, and so you have you you all should have them. If you don't see the picture, just email me and let me know, and I'll resend it. Okay. Um, okay. Good. Uh, so I'm going to stop the share. I'm actually wait. I have to go to the whiteboard. And I'm going to save the PDF. Okay, so I remembered. So I remembered to save it, and that's it. Okay, so have a good day. I'll see all of you tomorrow morning. Thanks for being here. See you tomorrow morning. Bye. You too. Have a good day. You're welcome.